Ah, what a glorious day. David Ostriker, here in beautiful, beautiful Carmiel in the middle of the, the first day of the summer, but it's warm and it's beautiful. You don't need an air conditioner. You don't need a heater. Everything is green around me. The birds are singing. It's fabulous. Eretz Israel, the land of milk and honey, the holy land. Okay, I admit I'm a little extreme here. I sound like a ad for Aaliyah. But today I allow myself to do that. Today is June 21st. It's the first day of summer, but that's not the reason. The reason is it's Parsha Shalach. Parsha Shalach is famous and it jumps at us every year when it comes to us because it is the Parsha of the Miraglim. Miraglim is translated as spies. Although I would argue that they were more tourists than spies, frankly. The Jews were roughly two weeks away from entering Israel. They had received the Torah. They had witnessed God destroy the Egyptians with ten plagues and then a final terrible plague at the end. They had seen the sea split for them and then collapse on the approaching army behind them. They had been fed with manna in the desert and water from a, a well that traveled with them. They had meat from birds when they demanded it. And they had stood at the foot of Sinai and literally heard the voice of God. And now it was time to enter the land. In two weeks they would march in and take the land. <clears throat> and they asked Moshe Rabbeinu, and God asked, and, and Moshe asked God, send ahead of us scouts, spies, to tell us about the land, in order that we could conquer it. This was a very strange question. Behind them lay in ruins the superpower of, the, of a thousand years of generations, Egypt. God had done that. And yet, they wanted a guarantee. They wanted a guarantee that God would, that they would succeed at conquering the people of Israel, what would become Israel, of Canaan. Send spies, send scouts. Moshe chose not really spies. It was strange. You know, when you choose a spy, he shouldn't be, you know, a, a six foot eight basketball player. He should be somebody who blends in, who looks like the rest of the community. But instead, God chose the princes of each of the tribes, men of great renown. So I would say they were more tourists who were evaluating the land. And indeed, that's what happened. They traveled the land. <clears throat> With the exception of Caleb and, and um, Joshua, they came back with a very strange report. They said that the fruit of the land is spectacular. Grapes are like what we would call watermelons. It's very lush, no question. And yet, it is a land that consumes and inhabits. It's a land of terrifying, fierce giants. And we, we, the princes of the tribes, were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And that night, the people cried all night. Well, the men did. And they grumbled and they talked about returning to Egypt, that they couldn't conquer the land. It was the most tragic single day in the history of the Jewish people. And there has been no end of it. Moses could not annul the decision the decree. The generation, that generation, 
would never enter the land. All of the men would die in the desert. 15,000 every year on the anniversary of this day. An anniversary that will truly live in infamy, in tragedy, in mourning for the Jewish people. The ninth day of Av, Tish B'Av, Tisha B'Av. The day in which the first temple was destroyed. The day in which the second temple was destroyed. The day in which the Crusades decimated Jewish communities throughout Europe. The same day that Columbus set sail, the day after Columbus set sail, in the midst of the Inquisition, 1492. The commencement of the First World War, which led to the Second World War, which led to the Shoah, the Holocaust, was the ninth day of Av Tisha B'Av. We sit on the ground, we have one day of mourning in the Jewish calendar. Tisha B'Av, we sit on the floor and we cry for the destruction of the temples. But more we should be crying for what it means that we were grasshoppers in our own eyes. And from that came all the exiles and all the suffering and all the diminution. And that's the story of the spies. But in a book called Sapphires from the Land of Israel, we learn how Rav Cook tells us that we should make a correction for that tragedy, do tshuva for that tragedy, and how to do it, because it seems we still suffer for it. The Torah writes that they despised a desirable land. And let me read you what Rav Cook said. How to rectify the sin. He says, we must declare that the entire world, to the entire world, the land's magnificence and beauty, its holiness, its grandeur. If only we could express, if only we could express and be greatly exaggerated, even in 10 thousands of desirability of the beloved land, the splendor, the light of Torah, the superior light of wisdom and of prophecy in the land, the quality of wonderful holiness that Torah scholars seeking holiness may find in the land does not exist outside the land. I myself, says Rev Cook, I myself can attest to this unique quality to a degree commensurate with my meager worth. And so it is that I began talking to you about how beautiful the land is. Rav Abba, from the time of the Talmud, when he would arrive in Akko, in Accra, he would get off the boat and kiss the rocks of the land of Israel. Rav Cook writes about this something very interesting. Why not kiss the soil? Ah, uh, because the soil is the basis of agriculture. The soil is from what everything grows. And kissing the soil makes a statement about the largesse, the gift that we get from Israel, the beautiful fruits that we get from the trees, the grain that grows in the fields. And Abba did not want to give the impression that's what he was thanking God for. He was thanking God for the very rocks of Israel that give nothing, it would seem except that they're foundational as well. He was thanking God for the air of Israel, for the air of prophecy that is in Israel. Let me conclude with two little stories of Rev Cook. He was meeting with somebody outside of Israel who was explaining that he wanted eventually to make Aliyah. And God willing, someday he would make Aliyah. And Ruth Cook said, be clear, God is willing. The question is, are you?
You know, prior to coming here, people asked me why I was doing it, and I couldn't really explain it. You know, I said, well, it's a good place to grow old. People respect old people in this country. You don't have to shovel snow in the winter. And a bunch of reasons. Right? Nobody believed me. In the end, I said, well, I guess for generations, my family, Levites, had wanted to come back here, so I'd give it a try. But Rev. Cook has a different point. When speaking with somebody who was hesitant and decided, after weighing the positives and the negatives about staying where he was or coming to the land of Israel, the person's calculation, his heshbon, was he would remain where he was. Rav Cook pointed out that before entering the land of Israel, they had to kill the king, King Sichon. He was the king of Heshbon. And so it is that if you're going to make such a, such a move, right, then you may have to destroy your Heshbon. Now, I have to tell you, I, I, I love the story, and it's a very... It's a wonderful point because you're making it for reasons beyond a simple calculation. But I have to tell you, and maybe I shouldn't, that the Israel of Rav Cook was only a hint of what the Israel is today, and perhaps today is only a hint of what the Israel will be tomorrow. Because whatever it is that you want is here. It really is here, you know, from superstores <laughs> to mountains, to desert, to rivers, to lakes. It, 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 everything is here. Horseback riding is here. Camel riding is here. You name it, you know. And of course, there's no better falafel. With that, I leave you and say, look forward someday to seeing you all in Eretz HaKodesh, Medinat Yisrael, the land of Israel, the nation of Israel. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. David Ostrecker here in Carmiel.